Let's welcome Pastor Alex. Thank you. I wonder if I need to take my shoes off. I noticed that barefoot is in style. That's what I'm talking about. If you got your Bibles, turn to Exodus. Uh, actually, don't. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. How about that? You know, this is something that it took me a while to to really come to understanding, and we have nowhere near the time to to get this taught in any depth at all. And I just want to kind of bring, um, just get into it a little bit, just to give you some idea. The main thing I want you to to to, to take note of in your own minds, in your mind's eye, is that Exodus. The time frame, when Exodus happened, what's going on in Exodus? You remember, the Israelites have been, they haven't heard from God in 400 years. And they're in captivity, they're in slavery, and they get delivered, right, from the deliverer. And they get baptized through the Red Sea parting. And then they ate the bread from heaven in the desert, right? This beautiful picture of the delivering power of Jesus in Exodus. And then God tells Moses as they are in the wilderness on the mountain, the mountain of God, that he's got this, this picture that he wants Moses to actuate. And it's the picture of a tabernacle. And what Paul talks about in Hebrews is, it's a duplicate of what's in heaven. And so, Lord, as it is on earth, as it is in... So we're going to bring the tabernacle down. And we're going to put it on earth. And the tabernacle is going to be a representative of of Jesus. It's going to be everything that Jesus did. And each element is going to represent some aspect of what you receive when you get Jesus. And so the point I want you to hear, or one of the points that I want you to just take note of, is that God already knew what he was doing and is doing and it's going to do with you. It's the same with you. What I want you to do, if I can tonight, and what the Lord's doing with me, is we get, we get blinded and we get, it's almost like we're looking into a flashlight that's really bright right in our face, or maybe lights of a car, or maybe straight into the sun. We get blinded by our position in life. We get blinded by where we live we get blinded by our, you know, our family issues. We get blinded by our employment. We get, we get in this little world, and, and we're blinded by the big picture of what God has for you. So if I could get you for a moment to step out of your world and actually begin to think of the possibilities that God might have for you if you can just get unstuck. If you can just step out into the possibilities that God has for you, instead of hindering yourself and confining yourself to your small world, you can actually begin to move into something that's bigger than you. Because he's already got it planned for you. Do you think God wants you to live a mediocre life? Does he think, you think, well, he just wants me to get by. He just wants me to, he just wants me to survive. God, God's plan for me is that I, that I have this little place over here and that I do my very best every day just to make myself comfortable. Is that his, is that his plan? Or do you think it might be bigger than that? I think it might be bigger than that. 
And what you're going to see with the tabernacle is that God had, has this incredible plan. If you look with me, first of all, golly, I ain't going to never have time to cover this. Before, keep your finger in First John, uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go to John chapter 1 real quick. This is rocking my world, so you're going to get wrong too because it's just what happens. When I get wrong, it's just what happens. You know, we, we've always, we always think, and the Lord's just really showing me this, and it's just, I'm just like, wow. I'm such a small thinker, and I'm a big thinker compared to some, but I, I'm just thinking to myself, oh, gosh. You know, we always say, well, what about the people in Africa who've never heard the gospel? Well, you know, what about them, God? Or what about, you know, this or that or the other? You know, the, the, the remote jungles of Brazil. I don't know. You, you know, you think of the place that you've got this picture of this remoteness that nobody's ever heard the gospel. Well, what about them? Why, why are they saved? Well, I want to just tell you something. This is something that the Lord has showed me. Let me re re read just First John chapter 9 real quick. First, I mean, John chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, I'm going to go to verse 8. Now I'm going to go to verse 6. There was a man, he was sent from God, and his name was John. His name was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came to be a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe, all through the light might believe, that he was not the light, John wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness to Jesus. Jesus was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. so that none are without excuse. Every man is born created in the image of God. And every man has the breath of God breathed in them because we have a spirit. We're the only thing that God gave a spirit, and he gave us dominion. And there's something in every man in history, all throughout history, we've been looking to worship something. In every man, there is this desire to worship. And it was placed there by God. And so we know that Jesus is the light of every man that's coming into the world. Now, here's the point. Jesus has plans for every man coming into the world. Listen, do you realize that every heathen, every person that you know, think of the worst person you know as far as this contrary to the ways of God? And I don't want anybody thinking about their husband or wife at this moment. So think about somebody else. I was supposed to be funny. Think about some heathen. You maybe it was you in your past life. I don't know. Right? You got them. Do you know their sin? You know Jesus came. He's already paid the price for their sin. Do you know that he died for them? He's it's done. He came and died for them. Their sins are forgiven as long as they actuate it. But the, the price has already been paid. It's already been done. He walked into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood on the altar for the sins of every sinner you know. And they have this spark in them, this light in them, this breath of God in them that says that they should begin to pursue God and if only that they would be, that they would actuate what Jesus had done. But it just, it builds, it snowballs, it gets, it gets bigger because as you come into uh, the, the fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He wants to broaden your mission. He wants to show you a destiny that you cannot do in your own strength. And he designed it long before you touch this planet. Because he is not, he is not, he is not, um, he is not, thank you, Joe. Joe, did you, are you in there? He is not confined 
to time or space, right? He already knows. He's already got this plan. So what is your job? Is to actuate the plan of God in your life. What does God say about you? He says, I've got plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. What is he saying to you and me? Man, I've got, I've got it planned out. What do you need to do? You need to learn to receive everything I offer you and begin to actuate the plan. Well, how do you do that? Well, you can't do it when you're confined and blinded by your own world. You've got to begin to believe that the God of the universe who calls you, who created you, who has plans for you, can do something big with you. That. That where, that's where it gets hard, isn't it? Because you know where you're at. You know exactly where you're at, and you're going, well, you just don't know where I'm at, Pastor. You don't know what's going on in my life. Well, I'll tell you this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care what's going on in your life because what I really care about is the bigness of God, not your condition, because it's the bigness of God that moves you, not your ability to move yourself. God said, I have put my Holy Spirit on these people, and they have vision. Listen, they have vision of what I've told you already. And they're not only going to have the vision, but with their hands, they're going to be able to form it and bring it about, just as I see it. I'm giving it to them. Do you know Ben? How many know Ben Carson? He, he, he was running for president, and he probably would have been an outstanding choice. Mm -hmm. But, he's not. But he uh, was the first person to separate Siamese twins at the head. They were connected at the head in the brain. And he said he couldn't figure it out. He said nobody had ever done it before. And he couldn't figure it out. And he said he woke up. His testimony is this. He woke up in the middle of the night and the Lord had showed him how to do it. And he carried out. He actuated the vision God gave him and it worked. There are so many things. Do you think Thomas Edison invented electricity? He didn't invent electricity. He discovered it. God invented it. And God gave him the ability to figure it out in some degree. Now just think about that for a moment. But God's plan for you isn't for you to build your little world, your little kingdom, your little stuff. His vision for you is to impact people incredibly. One of the things, and in, in, in as a church, uh, you know, as a person, as a pastor, as a worship leader, I, you and I probably have never been as stretched or as challenged to become what God wants us to be than we are right this minute. You know, he, he, he wants us to have more influence than we ever thought we could have. He wants us to begin to voice who he is with, with excellence, to, to increase our ability, our, our skill level and what we do so that we can, so our voice can be heard in more places. More people, we were just, I was just talking to Joe earlier, more people are listening to our podcast than ever before. We almost have a whole nother church listening online at, at current time, which is a fantastic thing, but it's scary as the dickens. You think about that for a minute, but the same, I think that wants to be exponentially expanded, but the same is true. What I'm saying with that is, I'm not saying that to, to boast about our church. What I'm saying that about that is God's got something for you because you're going to bring the kingdom because aren't many churches bringing the kingdom. And you need to be bringing the kingdom. And we're going to be bringing the kingdom to people. And so he's got this big goal, this big thing stretched out. So in this, just real quickly, what we're going to discover, and we're going to just read Hebrews 9 and 10, as we, I'm going to go over it, and then we're going to just read what Paul has to say about it. I just want you to hear what Paul says. And that's going to be the end of it. But what, what they used to do 
in Old Testament in the, in, the, in the tabernacle that was built by God, it is very basic. It really has five pieces of furniture. You come into a, an open area, this, this fence, and it's not very big. It's, it's bigger than this room, but not a whole lot. It's about, it's about as big as our church building. It's about 12,000 square feet, something like that. And you come into this area, and as soon as you walk in, there's a seven and a half by seven and a half place where they sacrifice bulls. And there's this fire there, and it's got four horns on each corner, and they sprinkle the blood on each one of those horns for, the, for, for, for sin. And each family, each male and each family brings the sacrifice for his family, and they make a sacrifice for the sin. And then the priest, as they do business, they, they, they come to this basin, this, uh, this, this um, it's called the laver, and it is, it is a uh, prophetic vision of the word of God, and, and it emphasizes the regeneration of what Jesus does and the doctrine of baptism and the whole idea of being sanctified or set apart or cleansed by the work of Christ. And so what they do before they go into what they call the holy place, after they've offered the sacrifice, is they wash. There's a cleansing that's going on. There's a washing of hands, which would make, if you, if you hear where Pilate, when he, when he says, you know, I have no part of this, and he takes a basin, and he washes his hands and purifies. It would be a lot more significant because the priest did that before they went into the holy place as a, as a idea that, they have, that, they're not, that they're not guilty any longer. And so, so what Pilate did was did their own deal. He did what the priest did. He said, I'm washing my hands of this event. And so then they go into the holies, the holy place, which has three pieces of furniture. It has an altar of incense. It's right in front of the door to the, to the holy of holies. And it is a, it's just an aroma going up before God, which, which is a representative of Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding on your behalf. And so it's this idea that Jesus is constantly interceding for you so that you can be successful, so that you can carry out your mission, so that you can get a hold of the vision of God that he has for you, no matter how hard life has been so far, no matter what you've gone through or whether you understand what you've gone through or not, it makes no difference to what God's ultimate plan is for you. Because he can even take some of the bad things. It says he takes your junk... This is the gospel according to Alex. He takes your junk and he makes something good out of it for those who love him, love him, committed to him, serve him, and are called according to his purpose. In other words, as you see your destiny in God and as you are a uh, putting your heart out so that you are devoted to him. He says he'll take your junk or, or your hard places or the things that you just don't understand and somehow, some way, he's going to bring something good through it. And there's some hard stuff in the room. I understand that. There's some hard, hard things that we're never going to get understanding on this earth of why. But God says in his word that his plan, he will, he, will, he will make something good in you because he's going to carry out something bigger than you. you. You know, golly, how many of you know that when you get free from something or when you get delivered, how many are, do we have former addicts in the room? Would you raise your hand? Former addicts, raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Liars, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, good. I'm right, just making sure. Do you know? <laughs> do you know that you have the gift to impart healing to addicts if you've been delivered from addiction? You know why I know that? 
Because you've been set free. When you've been set free, you can pray over people with power. Why? Because you've been set free. If you're still in bondage, might be a whole nother deal. So how does it work something good? Well, whatever you went through and whatever was really hard for you and whatever you had to walk through and, and, you, and you've come to a place where you've settled and you love him and you trust him, you don't understand, you, you, you can't figure it out, but at some point, he's going to have you minister to somebody that has gone through exactly what you've gone through, that's going through. And you're going to be able to minister yeah. the love of God and the power of Jesus. So that is a possibility of how he works it out to good. But the point is, he's already got this planned. He's already got it planned. And so you go, you got the, the candlestick, which has got seven, and there's all kind of things that go with the candlestick. There's a, there's a, the, 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 the uh, you wash your hands, and then you got the golden lampstand, and it's got seven, seven different uh, arms on it, and it is um, a prophetic thought of Jesus as being the light of God, and, and then on the other side you've got the showbread, which is a pr prophetic um, look at Jesus being the bread of God. And so is the manna in heaven. You know, they got just a little bit of God every day, the Word of God. And then you've also got that altar of incense, that, prof that prophetic look at Jesus as our intercessor and mediator. So that's all in the temple, and it's all pointing to Jesus. And Jesus said that he did not come to eliminate any of this stuff. So that's what you need to really get clear in your mind. Jesus says about this this tabernacle, and all, I didn't come to eliminate all that stuff. I am that stuff. All it's doing is pointing to me. I, you know, I'm it. I fulfilled it. I've done it. And so then you go into the Holy of Holies, and in that Holy of Holies is the mercy seat of God, and it is a prophetic view of Jesus who God hides his laws in. That's where he put put the Ten Commandments, was in the Holy of Holies, that he is the true manna, and he put uh, the rod and the fruit of the rod inside that thing. It was Aaron's rod that, that budded and all that kind of stuff. It's in the middle. It's in the Holy of Holies, and it represents where the presence of God is. And the priest, only one priest, could go in there once a year. And the first thing he had to do was make atonement for himself, and then he made atonement for the people, Right? But he could only go in there once a year. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, it says that that is the veil that was rent so that everybody could have access to the Holy of Holies and the mercy seat of God. And Jesus sprinkled his blood. There, there's, I bet you, and, and I can't wait to see, but there's a picture as if when Jesus was cru crucified that he walked into the Holy of Holies and for the very last time he sprinkled. He didn't have to sprinkle it on for himself because he had no sin, but he sprinkled it on for you and me so that we would never, ever, ever have to do it again. It was done once and for all. <laughs> and it is a picture of of the redeeming power of Jesus. So nothing you ever have done is held against you because Jesus once and for all put the blood on the mercy seat. And so the mercy of God was activated towards you in your life. The mercy of God. How then are you condemned? Well, it's not Jesus. It's not God. I didn't come to condemn the world, but through me that you might be saved.
once and for all. What do you have to do? To actuate it in your life. You have to know that it's true. You have to believe it and begin to live like it. You can't live condemned. You can't keep pointing at yourself saying you just don't cut it. Any time that you think that, and the only thing I want to say about what Anna was saying, less of me and more, what she was really saying with that was the junk, the things that don't look about you, less of that. But see, God, this is what I want you to understand about you. God loves you. He created you. He loves your personality. He created your personality. He doesn't want you to get less. He wants you to get straight. He wants it to rise up. He wants it to get good. He wants it to be full. He wants it to blow up. He just wants your junk gone. And what's your junk? The things that you don't have mercy on yourself about because Jesus did. The things you heap upon yourself that keep you in a prison, that make you think somehow that you're refined to this limited space that God, he says, listen, you're free. Bust out of that space. Take the lid off. You're a miraculous God. You want to work miraculous things in me and through me. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you can't do that when you keep condemning yourself. You can't. He knew this. He knew this. He, he, he put a picture of it in, in Exodus. That's book two. And then he went 2,000 years before he fulfilled it with Jesus. The whole world for all creation even the earth because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth he redeemed it all he came back to save it all it's done it's already been done it's, it is done it just hasn't been actuated right so walk in His plan. He says about you, I'll make your path straight. I love that thought. I'm really good at making my path crooked. You? All right. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. That's where I was going to start. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to read it. I promise because we got nursery workers. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinance of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, 24 carat, by the way, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod, and the budded, that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. We, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the sins people's sins that were committed in ignorance the Holy Spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing y'all getting that y'all tracking with me you understanding that besides Joe okay it was it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. I wish I had my ESV. Anybody got one? 
Hmm? Who's got it? Can I have it? Can I have it? Or oh, you got it on your phone? Beautiful. Where am I? Eight. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the, the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation. All oh, that's good. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all, say that with me, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer signify for the perfection of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise of of eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a, where a will is involved, the death of the, the one who made it must be established. In other words, the death of the Old Testament has to happen before the New Testament. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified. Did you just hear that? It, did you just hear that? That was so good. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as he has appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with the sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. Amen? For since the law has been, was but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sins, consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body has been prepared for me. But a body have you prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings? You've, you've taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus said that. 
When he, when he has said the above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, we, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made his footstool at his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds. How long? No more. Where there is forgiveness of thee, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since you have confidence to enter the holy place, places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil con conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and do good works, not neglecting to meet with each other as a habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of Jesus' return. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, are no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. You want me to read that one more time? For we, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of the fire that will consume the adversaries of God. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the formal days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and, reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which was a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised to you for yet a little while, and, come, and the coming one will come, and he will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are, not, and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That's pretty good, ain't it? That, rock, that rocks. Just say that to somebody. That rocks. God has already got it planned out for you. Do you see all that? I mean, it's in there like crazy. All the way to the end. It's just actuating what's already done. That's receiving from God what He has for you and then beginning to carry it out in your life. With your children, with your spouses, with your workplaces, with your sphere of influence, that you bring the kingdom of heaven. Get outside your world 
Quit thinking about being in an American, um, an American in 2016 and think about being an alien here, a sojourner, that you are part of the kingdom of God and you're going to do the work of the kingdom of God and it's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. Take the top off. Right? God wants to take the top off this church. It's been prophesied. It was prophesied again with Don Potter. You know how he does it? You take your top off. You take your top off. You quit being religious. You could quit putting limits on God. You start doing what he asked you to do. Amen? We're going to build a building. Y'all know that? Because they're coming. We're going to have to sacrifice. There's no way to build a building without sacrificing. I'm not talking, I'm talking about your finances. We've got to sacrifice. Heather, you're moving Thursday night, right? Friday night. You need some help? Heather, raise your hand. What time are you moving? Six o'clock Friday night. Church, single mama. How many kids you got? <laughs> Seems like six, but it's just three. Just you, right? For me, that's a widow and orphan. I'm just telling you. God says, if you want to, if you want to, if you say you know me, you're going to help the widows and orphans. That's not guilt. That's truth. Friday night, 6 o'clock. Please see Heather. Philip, don't you do it. Philip's going to the hospital Wednesday, right? If God doesn't heal you between now and then and have your kidney removed, they're going to remove the kidney. A cancer in uh, a tumor in the kidney. We're gonna pray for him. Amen. Are you stretched out? I want you to be stretched out. I want you to think bigger than just what you got to do tomorrow. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we have vision, that we have radical, audacious vision from heaven that we know that the power of the Holy Spirit will give us dreams and visions of the possibilities with you, that you will empower us to do great things, that you will empower us to carry out the plan that you established before the world. No matter how far off track we've gotten, no matter how far off we're off track, God, in the church and as individuals. Your Holy Spirit anoints us to carry out your details. Give us vision, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you and apologize to the workers for me when you go back and pick up your kids. Thank you very much. God bless you. Y'all bring somebody with you. Y'all excited about what God's doing in your life? Obviously you are. There's a whole church in here on Wednesday night. Let's get somebody else in here and let them, let them get saved. Amen? Amen.